all so much for being here with us at St. Andrews. Um, as we remember and give thanks um, for the life of Paul. Um, my name is Sarah Sumner Eisenbaum, and I'm one of the pastors here along with Pastor Manuel. Um, for those of you who are visiting and you haven't been here before, um, I do want to share that we do not have any restroom facilities in this building. And so if you need access to those uh, before the service ends, You'll just follow the sidewalk here along to our community center. If you keep going here, there will be double doors on your right. You can go through those double doors and then turn left and you'll find access to our restrooms um, there. I also want to remind you all to please um, stick around following the service. We do have a time of reception. And when um, the family is asked and invited you to please stay um, for some refreshments and time to continue to share stories and be together um, as we honor and remember Paul today. So again, thank you all for being with us. There's a lot of beautiful, wonderful music that was chosen because of Paul's great love of music. And so we're going to start with um, a really special hymn um, for the whole Pearson family, and that's number 732 morning cry. And again, if you haven't used our hymnals before, you're looking for the big numbers on the top of the page, and that'll get you to 732. You can just ignore the small numbers on the bottom. That's not, not going to And so together we'll sing our opening hymn, morning cry.
grace and glory. We remember before you today our brother Paul. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so we may see in death the gate to eternal life. That we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think uh, Michael will be hearing Paul's life. Paul Robert Pearson was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Her and uh, Jenny Pearson on October 27, 1935. January 19, 2023, Paul passed away in San Diego, California, surrounded by family. Paul was baptized and confirmed the Augusta Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, graduated from Robbinsdale High School, and then attended Augsburg University for one year before entering the U.S. Navy. Stationed in South Weymouth, Massachusetts, Paul served on active duty for two years before returning to Augsburg, for which he graduated with a degree in music education and biology. While at Augsburg, he met his forever love, Maxine Larson. Paul was in the Augsburg Choir, and both of them were in the Augsburg Band. After the two were married in Paul's senior year, they went on a six-week honeymoon to Alaska on tour with a 60-member band. The Pearson family grew to be a family of four with the addition of his daughter, Kristen Marie, and his son, David Mark. For two years, Paul taught in Aiken, Minnesota, and then taught for one year in Muskegon, Michigan. At that time, Paul decided to leave teaching to pursue a career in the pharmaceutical industry. After serving as a sales representative in Minnesota for working on, he became a hospital specialist in Chicago, where the family lived for three years. Then he became the director of training at the company's home office in New Jersey, where he lived for nearly 40 years. Paul moved the head of the company as director of special chemicals and, pro and product manager before retiring. When Max retired in 2014, Paul and Max moved to San Diego. Being Swedish was always very important to Paul. His parents and the oldest sister immigrated to the U.S. from Sweden. Because his parents wanted their children to be American, they didn't teach Paul to speak Swedish when he was young. When Paul was 11, the family went by ship to Sweden to live there for a year with the Pearson family. While on the ship, the crew taught Paul how to speak Swedish, and while in school in Sweden, Paul's teacher one day told him, if you can't speak proper Swedish, don't speak at all. <laughs> at Augsburg, Paul started directing church choirs when he was in college. He was either a choir director or sang in the choir until he moved to California. While at church in Minneapolis, his choir, augmented by children in, in the orchestra, performed a musical, Felt Like It Is. There were performances at churches, as well as, as well as others in Minneapolis. One weekend, the choir traveled to Duluth, Minnesota to give a performance there. Paul also directed a city choir and was the director of the all-male choir at the American Swedish Institute. Paul was a soloist and sang for many weddings, many funerals, and many church services. When Paul first moved to New Jersey, he purchased a pipe organ for from a hospital in Nobel. He spent countless hours for that first year disassembling the organ, packing it, planning to reinstall it in the Pearson home. The church at the time was entering a building and remodeling project, so the family decided to donate it to Trinity Lutheran Church in Gilbert, New Jersey, where it now resides and is used all the time. Paul had other interests besides music. He was an avid golfer, winning tournaments in New Jersey, he also loved ice hockey and served as a team coach when David Mark was playing as a youngster. Later on, he started working with the high school hockey program in Morris County, New Jersey. 
Paul was with that program for 30 years as the Secretary of the Treasurer for the League, in charge of minor officials, and the minute of being a game announcer. He loved being involved with the sport, the coaches, the players, and the fans. Paul loved traveling, Chinese food, entertaining, photography, spending time with his family and friends, and was a fab fabulous joke teller and socializer. <laughs> Paul's Christian faith, faith was of most importance to him. He was actively involved in congregations when the family lived and served in church councils, stewardships, music programs, financial secretaries, and youth leader and welcoming member of the year. The highlights of his life were two grandsons, David Paul and Michael. His granddaughter-in-law, Emma, and his two great-grandchildren, Ivy and Barrett. He loved going on activities, sporting events, playing with them, talking with them, just playing games with them. He was a very loving husband, dad, pop up, and far far. Paul died after his son, David Mark. Should be reading this today, but they're together again forever. Paul has survived. Sorry. <laughs> He's survived by his living wife, Max, his daughter, Kristen, his grandchildren, David, Paul, and Michael, and David's wife, Emma, his great grandchildren, Ivy, Jean, and Barrett, his sisters, Nancy, Sue, cousins, nieces, nephews. Many friends. Now we're going to continue with our time of eulogy and invite David, grandson David and Jim, to be friend. And we're going to come forward and share more words of eulogy. After this, uh, Pastor Manu will be sharing. Uh, will be sharing in a time of open sharing and time of remembrance uh, with our microphone. And so Pastor Manu will walk around. And if any of you would sh like to share a brief memory, thought, story about Paul, um, you'll be invited to do so in just a moment. I want to thank David though for continuing with our time of eulogies. Uh, and try out a little response story over the field, if you don't mind. So, then go a little, a little something like this. So, my arm comes up. And scoring for Del Barton. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it a try. Ready? And scoring for Del Barton. All right, one more time. Let's go a little deeper. <laughs> talk about you know, a couple things that my grandpa really loved. Uh, first thing was kids. My grandfather loved kids. And whether it was the joy of being a perpetual child himself or perpetually surrounding himself with the joy of other children, he could not keep himself away from that most pure kind of joy. He coached, he taught, he directed, he parented, grandparented, and great-grandparented. As much as he loved Kristen and David, it won't be hard to hear affirmations from Joe, Jim, Bob, Lisa, Scott, Bob, Harry, Jeff, the Count of others. That Paul Pearson was a father to all of them. And then there's myself and Michael and Miriam and my son Barrett and of course I. I knew him as a grandfather who wholeheartedly embraced the role of curmudgeon. <laughs> I can remember Michael and I running up to him and doing something that would just absolutely annoy the hell out of him, only for him to scowl and shout at us, send us running away and screaming with laughter. And if we happened to look over our shoulders, 
as we were running away, and we'd see him smirking and giggling at the room. <laughs> and while those scowls and shouts only got stronger with Ivy and Barrett, the smirks and giggles only got twice as strong. Farfar's best moment with Ayoli was bouncing her on his foot and teaching her the Swedish folk song, Rida, Rida, Ranka, Hesten, Hater, Blanka. I'm pretty sure Ayoli could still sing it today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when he was getting older and not able to get, as much, get out as much as he would have liked, he was always asking when the next time our kids could come visit him. And as close as my dad was with his mom, my grandma, I think we all know how much Paul really missed him. And I definitely know that being able to reunite with him is one of the biggest parts of his ultimate peace. And it's also no coincidence that Ivy is one of the last names and faces you probably remember. Without his music and his love of music, I really am not sure what my attachment to him would look like. He sang, he directed, he arranged pieces, and I don't know if he and Max would have fallen as deeply in love as they did without it. I mean, if you could make it through a passionately romantic, weeks-long bus trip <laughs> to and from Alaska, <laughs> chaperoning a college band, <laughs> then you truly have a boundless love together. <laughs> there was one time a few years ago when he decided to start singing some old Lutheran hymn, and my grandma naturally and wordlessly moved to the piano to accompany him in a way that only the deepest lovers know that they play their separate parts to make a beautiful whole. And as he sang the melody, she accompanied him and sang the harmony. But after a bit, he started to drift off key and off rhythm a little. My grandma was giving him little glances from the side of her eye while keeping up with him. Okay, we're, we're playing that one flat this person. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, while he kept pushing the melody, he started giving her little glances and scowls out of the side of his eye, too. Until he finally got fed up, fed up and snapped at her, well, if you don't know the harmony, you just shouldn't play it at all. <laughs> She just stared back at him incredulously, not saying a word. You know, it really was a virtuoso accompanist who has mastered the art of following the winds of a virtuoso solo. <laughs> but he really could carry a tune. And I remember since I was very, very young that he wasn't around anymore, or in his own quiet moments, he was always whistling. Sometimes it could be hard to find the tune that he was carrying, Sometimes it seemed like there might not even be a tune at all, but he would carry it anyway. And only since I've gotten older have I really picked up the beauty in this, and I did so in two ways. One, I am an introvert. Uh, it can be hard to be around lots of people, and I prefer my quiet moments too. But not because I don't like people, but because in those quiet moments, we can fill the air, fill our minds with the music that is most pleasing to ourselves without all the background of other people's playing. And so we should make a point to, and take care to give ourselves those moments with that music, whatever it may be. Two, there are many times in life where it seems like the tune is hard to find, or you might feel like there might not be a tune at all. But you damn well better carry it anyway, because eventually you will find it. But the thing that I most identify my grandpa with is hockey. He coached, he organized, he was a PA announcer. And like kids and like music, he surrounded himself with it all the time. The first hockey game I can remember going to was just me and him when we crossed into enemy territory. <laughs> and we watched the New Jersey Devils play the New York Rangers in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> our beloved Devils won that game, and from then on, I was hooked. Now, I never really played hockey, and I'm sure there was plenty of spoken and unspoken 
conversation and disappointment between me and my dad that I could not escape. But I'm still hooked. Just ask my wife how helpful I am if there's an important game on. Uh, and there was one time, about seven or so years ago, when I was still living here with Max and Paul and Kristen, that I saw the devils were traveling to play the ducks up in Anaheim, Han just up the highway. With serious conviction, I bought tickets and then loudly declared, I'm taking him to a hockey game. <laughs> Max kept doing her crossword puzzle because she didn't hear me. And Kristen laughing because she saw that Max didn't hear me, said that that was probably a good idea. <laughs> and it was. It was a great time for us to drink beer, <laughs> talk shop, and most importantly, watch hockey. Well, he watched a lot of hockey, and I watched a lot of him. You see, this was at a time when he was starting to decline a little bit, you know, fumbling over words, starting to forget names. So I wasn't really sure how this was going to go. But let me tell you, hockey is something that got this man out of his seat. Literally. He would be rising out of his chair a good 10 seconds before anyone else in the arena because he could see the play developing in a way that only someone who spent their entire life around a sport pit. And sure enough, when the devil scored the first goal, he rocketed up and screamed before I could, and did so without a game, without help, without any kind of hurt. Mm. It was the most laser-focused and lucid I had seen him. And I think it's only fitting that the first game I remember going to, and the last game he probably remember going to, was the devil's winning. For nearly 30 years, he was one of the biggest figures in North Jersey high school hockey, which is second only to Minnesota hockey fandom, don't you know? <laughs> and had several jobs there, one of which was to pick out the high school championship banners that still hang in this tiny arena in Morristown, New Jersey. For one particular division, uh, he decided the banner should be green. And in that particular division, one tiny little high school seemed to win year after year after year, having their name plastered across this green canvas. And sure enough, this particular school's color was green. It almost seemed predestined, or maybe calculated on his part. And he got lots of flack for that color choice. I ended up going to this very high school, which goes by the name of Del Bart. <laughs> and I had countless fond memories of watching him play hockey in that arena. That was my grandfather's domain. He was the timekeeper and PA announcer there, and he was any but neutral or professional. <laughs> Being involved there for so long, he knew all the coaches, referees, and could pick out which players would make it pro and which ones would fall just short. And when the refs made bad calls, he would pound glass and shout at them for being so lousy. When kids would end up in the penalty box right next to his booth, he would let them know if they keep taking boneheaded penalties like that, their career is over and probably the rest of their life. <laughs> now, there's plenty of things that I remember about that arena. The well-trodden and unspringy rubber floors, the smell of Zamboni room and artificial cooling. But mostly it's the sounds of metal blades carving and thrashing the ice, body slamming into plexiglass boards, but most of all, and I can say without a doubt that to this day and forevermore, the most commonly said set of words in that arena is my grandpa's voice booming from the rafters. Sorry, Max. 
So our families um, cross paths in what I call the formative years. For me, grade school, through grad school, and beyond. So how did it all start? Well, it was my middle school football game, and their son David and I, basically share a birthday, by coincidence, were playing. And my sister Linda, and certainly Kristen at times, were doing their cheerleadings. And alone in the stands was this crazy guy <laughs> repeating all of the cheers and dancing along with the cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> my father thought that was hysterical and went to join in. <laughs> and thus, a friendship was born that grew into much, much more. So my dad came home with a new best friend. So as we found out, Mr. P loved to tease. He loved food and its preparation, but more about that later. So as a background, yesterday was St. Patty's Day, as you all know, the high holy holiday of Corey family. <laughs> <laughs> my mother cooks Irish, a land. Oil, no salt, no pepper, nothing. But she wanted to have Pearsons over for dinner and dessert. So my mother actually baked a cake and proudly served it to the families. Mr. P just kind of surveyed that table, picked out my sister, walked up behind her as she was starting her cake, and put his finger right into the center of it and asked, Is it fresh? <laughs> And then he laughed and carried on, and of course, my sister, by the way, um, ate completely around my finger. <laughs> so, you knew this was going to get fun. But that was the beginning. And then the family started vacationing together. So, the first one I recall was at the Jersey Shore Surf City. My parents had uh, uh, the Pearsons over. And sometime later, Max and Paul reciprocated when they took us camping. And they had a camper right there in their driveway, a pop-up camper that they were very proud of. So remember the food stories? So Paul introduced us to Bialis at breakfast. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know what that is, that's like half bagel, half muffin, lots of onion stuff on it. Um, he also introduced uh, eggshells into the percolated coffee because apparently that makes it less bitter and my mom was absolutely involved. Her. And uh, for the first time, we had s'mores for dessert, which I thought was super cool. But on that same camping trip, came along the camera, and everybody knows Paul, knows Paul, loves photos. And if you've been to Max's house, you've seen him. He has pictures everywhere. Well, this is in the late 70s, so the camera that Paul was using at the time was a manual 35 millimeter camera with slide film. So, he gave it to us kids, probably to get out of the campground, and told us to go take pictures. No instructions, no <laughs> autophobias, nothing. And at the end of the trip, we all went to the Pearson's house to enjoy a slideshow. <laughs> he proudly displayed every blurry picture and left along the way, recalling the memories of the entire trip. Really fun. As time progressed, the, Chris, uh, the Corey Pearson Christmas Eve tradition started. Every year, the Sunshine and Snowflakes album came out. The Dingers, the Candles, you can ask Chris later about those. The Swedish Ludvist with the Allspice. The Apple Cake with Rum Sauce. Please recall the bland Irish diet that the Corys are coming for. Paul loved it. He takes such enjoyment in it every meal, every year. But I guess if you're gonna play extended family, remember all of those experiences filled with laughter and fun come with a huge responsibility. And did Paul step up to the plate? So my sister, a new driver, she ran a red light, pushed another car into a gas station pump, oh. <laughs> Thankfully no one was hurt, but we like to report that perhaps the gas station guard dog didn't fare very well. <laughs> But my parents were out of town, so who was the first call? Mr. P. My youngest brother Joe was here. He was at our mountain house with some high school friends, and they decided they were going to 
to go hunting in the snow. And Mr. P wandered out into the snow and the cold to actually help them dress their first year. And he told Joe, well, when he lived in Minnesota, there was no problem, he'd just go shoot moose, it was no big deal. So I thought that was pretty cool. But from good stories, go to part two. Once again, the Cory parents are gone. So the baby Cory Joe is left in the nest. Do you think he'd get into mischief? Of course he did. Mr. P was the first person who called to bail him out of jail when he was arrested for public drinking. <laughs> So now, one would think that with events like this, things would cause some stressors on the friendship, and these two families may start to fracture that bond. Not with the Pearsons. They kept that family union tight. So I have two young memories um, of Paul. In high school, I actually had two Brazilian exchange students stay with me, Chico and Chica, for a short time. And on a Sunday morning after church, Max and Paul invited us to have breakfast with them, which we did. And Max got up to clean the dishes, and Paul was saying, so what are your plans today? And I'm like, well, I don't know, I guess I'm going to take them to the mall. Without hesitation, Paul screams across the road, Max, get in the car. We're going to New York City. And he took us to the World Trade Center and Battery Park on a freezing February afternoon, and we saw the southern shore of New York, and I was so appreciative. And I hope I thanked you back then, but if I didn't, this is a long time coming. But also on a really cool note, Mr. P, after he got out of uh, Oregon, he became a real estate agent, and he was our broker for my wife and I's very first house in Randolph, New Jersey, where we grew up. So, very fond memories. Uh, you will meet my oldest brother, Bob, here momentarily. Uh, and some of the earliest memories I have is that Bob and Kristen um, were the oldest siblings. So, of course, they sneak off into the woods and smoke cigarettes. And <laughs> they torment my brother, Joe, to, you know, go get lost, essentially. But one of the coolest memories that I can uh, share is that when Bob joined the Peace Corps in the mid-80s, Mr. and Mrs. P were there in our house to see him off. Yeah. But more importantly, Bob called Mr. Pearson from the Dover bus station at the neighboring town to come pick him up from the Peace Corps so he could surprise my parents upon his arrival after three years from coming home from Africa. Oh. Pretty cool. This is a man who was always there for us. This is a family who was always there for us. So I ask, what is the true litmus test of a family's love and trust like that? Anybody? When the family dog accepts you. Clearly, right? <laughs> On the 4th of July, the Corys were at the Pearsons after a fireworks display at the local county college. Our houses were really not close, but somehow my dog Sally managed to break out of our house, ran through the woods, and ended up on Pearson's front porch. <laughs> now, undisputably, this relationship is officially cemented and I am fine. Right? <laughs> All right, so fast forward. My folks, Ken and Mary Jo Corey, and Mr. and Mrs. P, coincidentally celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary within three weeks of one another. So they went to Hawaii together for a month. Did I mention that Hawaii has moon bubbles? <laughs> they did a lot. <laughs> but we kids had a party for them upon their return. And real Vegas odds were being made on if they would return, either being more besties or not speaking to each other ever <laughs> again. But we kind of figured out where that bet went. So some years later, they also spent three weeks traveling to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden to see the town where Paul grew up, his childhood home, and his one-room school house. So here we are. 
50 years later, the Corey boys have a second set of parents and two siblings that have been intertwined into our lives. This is a house of faith. I truly believe this is a union that God wanted us to share together. These life experiences, this is the type of friendship and love that doesn't just happen. It is extremely special. Our families have shared many, many laughs, mixed in with some very deep emotional setbacks. But we've done it together as one family. And it all happened because one man was crazy enough just to be himself. His magnetic personality drew us all in. Paul enjoyed to tease, to laugh, to enjoy life, to love completely and unconditionally. And we all here have benefited because of it. I will continue to miss him.
in the choir box. I want, I want to speak on behalf of uh, this congregation. Uh, Paul and Max joined uh, the church in about 2014, and at that time they joined our, our seniors group called the Keenagers. And um, Paul was always such a joy to have. We used to tease each other, and I, I, I remember when he told me he could not eat baked beans anymore, and he was very sad. <laughs> <laughs> but what I remember most is, uh, as a choir member, when we would sit up front, and I would watch Paul in the congregation when I thought to look up for my music, and he was always singing along. And I tried several times to get him to come join the choir, but he was through with that. But I want to say this, he never really left the choir. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say that Paul was always a gentleman. And what fun it was to have him around us and see us. And I think that we missed out on a good part of his life. I would love to have seen him in his occupations, in his hobbies, and all the things that Max and Paul shared together. And I thank you all for sharing your family uh, because it enlightened us and just broadened our, our uh, friendship with him. Thank you. I've seen him before last year, before Christmas, with my family in the 5 o'clock p.m. 5 o'clock service, we were there. We were there saying hi to them. We were singing like, hi to them. And I've seen him a long time, a long time when he was there. And Max was there too. <laughs> Thank you, John. She just wanted everyone to know that she thinks that Farfar was a really great grandma. Aww. Our microphone is cutting out a little bit, but just hang in there. Is it working now? Yes. yes. All right. uh, Paul was my uncle, and I, when I was in college, uh, it was in the University of Illinois. We lived in Mount Prospect, and I was having trouble wondering if. I was doing the right thing. I was in my second year, and I came home one day, and Paul was sitting at the kitchen table with my mother, and um, and drinking coffee as usual, <laughs> right? And uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Paul seemed to like to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do that. <laughs> so anyway, I, I came in. He says, "How's it doing?" And I said, oh, "I don't know what's this college. I don't know if I'm." Electrical engineering, I don't know, I'm not excited about it anymore. I don't know what to do. He says, oh, I got an idea. He opens his briefcase, he was a salesman at the time and stopping in Chicago on business. <clears throat> opens his briefcase and he pulled out these green bar reports. I don't know if anybody understands what green bar is, but back in the old days, the computer would spin out reports on perforated paper and there was a little holes in the side and there was green bars and white bars. So to help you identify one line from another. So he pulls out these green bar reports and he said, look at this, the computer is amazing. It's telling us what we can sell and where we're selling it and, and who's doing the best job. He says, why don't you get into programming or something like that? He said, I think, I think there's a future there. And so, so I looked into it and uh, it turns out there was a, a, another college, Harvard College, that had a degree in programming. So I went there. Uh, Associate's degree, and then I got drafted, unfortunately, before I could start a job. But in basic training, they say, Does anybody already know some job? And they had a long list of things, and they started to blah, 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 blah. And when they said programming, bam, my hand went up. <laughs> so 
So for four years, I programmed in the Air Force, and from then on, I continued programming. I'm still programming today, after 60 years. He really made a difference in my life. He turned it around. All right, thank you.
The next reading is from John 14, 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I would go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one who comes to the Father accepts through me. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So our text today from the Gospel of John seems to be like it's asking us way too much of us. We're in the midst of grief after the loss of a loved one like Paul. Do not let your hearts be troubled. The disciples themselves do not seem too sure that they can do that, given their circumstances either. Now, a little background, I think, is necessary for us to understand the implications of Jesus' request. The disciple Judas has just left the upper room in the dark of night. Both he and Jesus know he will betray him for a small bag of coins. And then Philip wants Jesus to call God down so he can have proof. A troubled heart is something we allow to happen. And Jesus attempts to still their troubled hearts by telling them he is leaving and he's going to make a place for them where he is going. Now, on the one hand, it must have comforted them to be included. On the other, I know this kind of leaving must have troubled them all the more. Over the last few years, through Paul's decline, both he and Max went through a lot of ups and downs. Paul was determined to do things in his own way, sometimes struggling to accept that he couldn't always do what he thought he should be able to do, especially when it came to the things that he deeply loved. Throughout it all, Max demonstrated what I might call a divine patience and love for Paul, caring for him with such dedication and thoughtfulness. For a long time, Paul was determined to step up these stairs to receive communion. <laughs> you might notice that our altar is on the floor now. A huge part of that is because of Paul. He was determined to walk up these stairs when our altar was up here so that he could join the circle around the table and receive communion, much to the concern and distress of many of us here who watched him with holding our breath every week. But he loved worship and communion. His Christian faith and participation in his church were too important for him to give them up easily. And so it was after that that we decided it was time to bring the circle down to Paul so that he could continue to receive the bread and wine with that signature twinkle in his eye as he heard the words, Paul, this is the body of Christ given for you. I think this is part of what Jesus means when he tells the disciples that the way to the Father is through him. The way home is not about going to a place. It is about the relationships that make the place home. Jesus is going to prepare their place, wherever this that may be and wherever they will need it, because he already loves them. All through the Gospel of John, in our text from 
chapter 14, and earlier reading in chapter 11, with Martha's straightforward statement to Jesus about her brother's death that could have been prevented if Jesus had just gotten there when he should have. It is about connections. John writes of the connections the disciples and followers of Jesus will share and the difference this will make in their lives. So not allowing a troubled heart need not be seen as a promise of a pain-free, worry-free, and fear-free life. If we read verse 1 that way, it seems to promise too much. But it does say something about the kinds of things that Jesus thinks might trouble them. Jesus wants his followers and us to know that the only thing that should trouble hearts is separation from God and each other. His words about preparing a place intend to take care of that. Jesus promises that they too will have the ability to share this relationship with others. And part of their job as disciples will be to stay in relationship with one another so that they can be the place preparers for future disciples. John's use of the word house or family rather than building gives a sense of community and relationship. In the Father's house or family, there are many ways of being or dwelling. We translate the nominal form of the verb meno to abide as dwelling places. Abiding with Jesus weaves its way throughout the Gospel of John. And Jesus tells the disciples and us something important about where he was going to the Father. It's perhaps a relationship and not a place. These many dwelling places reveal to us not changes in geography, <clears throat> changes of the heart. It is an ongoing thing because it has already been done for us in some sense and remains a future hope for us as well. And so a transformation happens. A change of heart from trouble to peace-filled embraces these followers of Jesus as they learn along their way that Jesus has come with them and also goes ahead of them to prepare a place. A destination like this changes everything. A companionship like this changes everything. Now Paul's life was full of companionship. As he partnered with Max in creating a household, a home, a dwelling place for those in need. Now I'm convinced that he is with the Father, helping to prepare a dwelling place for us all, filled with all the beautiful music that he sang or whistled. As we heard in the reading from Romans, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know that Paul believed this and trusted in this promise all the days of his life, even through those final days when he struggled to express himself, even in the times when his memory seemed to fade. Paul's life was and is a witness to the love and promises of God. And those of us who knew him and loved him were blessed by the faith that shaped him into the person he was and will continue to be in our memories. Paul would want each of you to know how beloved you are, not just by him, but by God. And there is nothing, nothing you have done to earn that or keep it. But this love and grace is a gift, freely given without conditions from our Savior Jesus Christ. We thank God for this gift of grace, and we thank God today for Paul. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing one of his favorite hymns. Beautiful Savior.
again, we do want to welcome you all to communion. Um, we do, uh, I do want to invite uh, forward Emma and Bob who will be assisting. Um, we do also have communion, or excuse me, gluten-free wafers available. So if you need that, please let us know. And then as we come around to serve you, um, the wine is the lighter color liquid, the grape juice is the darker color liquid. So you make a circle here as our choir is demonstrating around the altar. Um, we'll give you a piece of bread and then an individual cup of either that wine or grape juice. Um, you're welcome to eat and drink of those elements. We'll collect your empty cups. And then after that, you'll be invited as you feel comfortable to do so, to take hands with your neighbors so we can offer you a blessing. And then you can return to your seats down the side aisle so the line can continue to come forward down the center aisle. If you still want to come forward but you don't want to receive communion today, you're still welcome to come forward. We just ask you to fold your hands so we know to offer you a blessing. Hopefully that's everything you need to know. The table has been prepared and all are welcome.
Now let us commend Paul, commend Paul to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Paul. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. <coughs>
with our family. They're going to step out with us and head over to the community center to prepare to receive you. Um, and then we'll be singing our closing hymn, Lift High the Cross. And so when that hymn has finished, you're welcome to depart through um, our narthex. Make sure you take a moment to sign the guest book. Um, you'll come again through our courtyard, through our big door there, and join us in our community center for a time of reception and, again, uh, refreshments and time to be together. So thank you again on behalf of the entire family for being here today um, as we remember Paul. <laughs>